Hello, everyone. I'm Sora Nelson, and I'm thrilled to introduce the fifth program in the series, The Political Mandate of the Arts, organized by the Student Council and presented in partnership with the Venda Museum, the Thomas Mann House, and Dub Lab Radio. The Student Council consists of a team of high school, undergraduate, and graduate students who invite prominent guest speakers to discuss topics related to art, culture, politics, and society. In conversation with visual artists, musicians, dancers, writers, theater and filmmakers, cultural critics, curators, and others, we explore how the arts can make a difference in times of social and political crises, on what social issues um, they can give new impulses, how they can help shape local, and how they can help shape local communities, and how the alleged freedom and autonomy of the arts might impede or help with the arts in terms of social and political significance. We welcome our viewers, viewers on Zoom as well as our listeners. Today's interview will be conducted by student council members Amy Cabrales, Emma Larson, Megan Ahalb, and myself. For our first four interviews, we invited conceptual artist David Horowitz, Kurdish German rapper Ebo, and Pal Palestinian poet Gayath Almadoun, and LA based choreographer Heidi Duckler. Our colleague Gina will put the links to these reported interviews in the chat. We are very happy to welcome our current guest speaker, Stephen Levine. Stephen was the long-term president of the California Institute of the Arts for 29 years. Among his many accomplishments at Cal Arts was the international diversification of the student body and the establishment of RUDCAT, the Roy and Edna Disney Cal Arts Theater, as an internationally recognized presenter of new work across the arts. Stephen developed Cal Arts into an internationally recognized center for creative and interdisciplinary exploration in the arts. Moreover, um, he has co-edited two, co two important volumes about museum politics, exhi Exhibiting Cultures, the poet, Poetics and Politics of Museum Display, and Museums and Communities, the Politics of Public Culture, both published by the Smithsonian Institution. Today's program will start with a 45 minute discussion moderated by Amy, followed by 15 minutes of a Q&A with the audience chaired by Emma. Please feel free to put your questions under the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen as the interview progresses. Keep your thoughts short and concise, no more than one or two sentences and one question at a time. Your questions can be submitted at any point during the program. We'd like to thank Susan Horowitz and Rick Feldman for generously supporting on-site and online discussion series at the Venda Museum. Now, Amy will start with our discussion. Thank you, Zora, for the introduction. And again, welcome, Mr. Levine, and thank you for coming to talk with us. Um, it's really cool to have someone from the administrative side to talk with us because for a while we've had more, you know, poets and choreographers and artists. Um, and I think it's just as important to have someone, you know, from behind the scenes. Um, so for our first question, we have uh, Megana. Um, you can go ahead and ask when you are ready. Thanks, Amy. Um, so I'm kind of touching on what uh, Zora said. You had a, a long career as a president of Cal Arts, and throughout your time, you had a significant impact on the institution. Um, during this time, have you seen any major shifts in the way students approach their art and the cultural and political value they attributed to their work? Were there any major changes, changes in the importance of art in enacting political and social change, particularly in the US where the political environment has gotten increasingly more polarized? No, it sounded like you had more you were going to ask. Okay. <laughs> um, well, let me, let me say CalArts had been politically and socially engaged from the start. Um, it, it was fundamental to our being uh, that art um, participated in the life of society uh, in ways that had uh, positive and negative effects. So it was it was always always central to to who we are. Um, in terms of evolution, I would say that when I first arrived, which was way back in 1988, um, a lot of the political activity was either AIDS related because young artists were still dying of AIDS in large numbers um, or uh, sort of trying to find one's personal identity. Um, which makes sense. You're 18, 19, 20, 21. You're still forming who you are and who you're going to be. Uh, so it's sort of inevitable. Um, then as we diversified CalArts, and the thing I'm proudest of is we started out when I first arrived as 
an almost entirely white institution, great institution already, but um, kind of monocultural in a way, except for a large gay population. Um, and by the time I left, we were more than 50% students of color. Um, I was really driven by the idea of equal opportunity and that if you're a great school, you have an obligation uh, to contribute to that. I don't know what's happened. I, I stepped down in 2017. Um, I'm not sure what's happened since then, although um, I would expect it is even more politically engaged. Uh, pretty much every group in America, um, except white males, um, feel as if they are threatened, that there's a whole political party that would like to see them disappear from the face of the earth. Um, and um, it's inevitable that that drives uh, artists into, um, if you're just being serious about your life, uh, it's inevitable that you engage in trying to answer that, that view of yourself. Um, so I, I get, so that, that's really, I could give a longer answer, but that's, that's my core answer. <laughs> if you want me to say more, I can. <laughs> Thank you for that. I definitely agree. Um, I think right now amongst college students or in Gen Z, uh, a lot of us are more politically inclined, especially with social media and how everything is, you know, there's so much information around and you can learn about various problems here and there that you're right. Like art is going to be inevitable in terms of these issues. Um, I know Emma had a follow-up question as well, so feel free to um, say it when you're ready. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for being here with us, Stephen. Um, I loved what you said about like finding who you are is political. It's interesting that art can be political both like with the self, but then also as like an act of society. Um, I'm curious, having worked and been a part of so many institutions that deal with so many different kinds of art. Um, do you believe that there is a singular art form that is the most effective at producing social change? Um, and if so, what is the value of other art forms? I, I don't think there is a single one that is, is most effective. Um, different moments and different circumstances sort of call on different artists to rise to the occasion. So if you take the feminist movement that, now this is already second generation feminism or third generation, but the feminist movement that arose in the 1970s and 80s, uh, and CalArts had the first uh, feminist art program in the country, or one of the first two actually, um, then, it, then it was uh, visual artists um, like Judy Chicago, uh, and performance artists like Carolee Schneeman, um, who were really helping form um, a women's sense of identity. Um, and the movement really, and underneath the, the overt political activity, was this discovery and assertion of who one distinctly was. But then if you take the civil rights movement, it's clear that um, music was the most important. Uh, we, we encapsulate it with, by referring to we shall overcome, uh, but black spirituals and the adaptation of African-American spirituals were all over the movement um, and present in every public action uh, and in some ways central for giving people the courage to stay together and face violent police uh, efforts to to shut them down. Um, if you look at if you look at what's happening with the uh, environment now, which clearly the future of the earth has become a major political issue, um, science fiction writers are playing an outsized role. People like Kim Kim Stanley, what is his last name? King Stanley Robinson? Kim Stanley, yeah, Robinson. Robinson, a wonderful writer. Uh, I recommend to all of you the book, his book, Ministry of Truth. Um, but it, it's about, it sort of imagines what it would take uh, to save this world, physically to save this world. 
uh, and the political challenges uh, as well as the scientific challenges of doing it. Um, anyway, one could go on through through all the arts. My own personal favorite is theater uh, because theater puts on the stage uh, visible oppositions in the form of human beings. Uh, you can see um, and identify with. Uh, but that's that's just a matter of personal taste. I can't say it's it's more important than the others. Um, um, I'm thinking what I left out. Dance rate, well, I, I'll stop. But dance is now playing a larger role uh, as we do away with the idea that the, the ballerina's shape is the only way to be a dancer uh, and open it to all sorts of other ways of physically being in the world and also, and with it, other stories about being in the world. Um, dance is, is playing a role, as it did actually in the thir in 30s. Uh, there was a lot of social activist um, dance going on, actually outright socialist dance going on in the United States in the 30s. So it's it's really all the arts. Thank you for that. I, I, I guess I guess what I would just add to that is visual arts gets the largest amount of attention in some ways by the critics, but that's in part because. Uh, visual arts have carried with it a sort of richer level of commentary um, ever since the 19th century uh, and reflection about the place of artists in the world. Uh, the other arts have been slower. Um, not the literature has not been slower, but the other non non written arts um, have been slower to theorize themselves. Uh, and then because visual arts are so tied up with money, they get, you know, public attention um, because everything they do gets echoed um, with dollar signs. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. But I like how you said how you know each form is significant in its own way. And depending on the historical context, some are more important than others. And I think you're right. We all have our favorites, but there's never going to be one that's the most important of all because they each have their own contribution. Um, yeah, switching subjects just a little bit, um, Zora has a question about uh, education and accessibility. Um, so whenever you're ready, Zora, go ahead. Thank you. And thank you again, Stephen, for being here with us. Um, I just want to talk, I did want to speak about um, just arts education and accessibility, um, because I know in various interviews, you've expressed your passion and advocacy for making arts education more accessible. And I come from an environment where our access to the arts within schools, unfortunately, is extremely rare and limited. So I just wanted to know, like, um, what are your opinions on how we can best combat these disparities, especially as, you know, a fellow artist myself, and I know we also have some artists amongst us as well. Sure. Uh, well, some days what I, I think that if all we taught in the schools was the arts and literacy, we would do a better job than we're doing now. Um, you know, as 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 a young person studying chemistry, you really can't make an what, what you think about chemistry doesn't really matter. Um, you just have to learn it, and it's years before you have something you can insert yourself. If artists taught uh, as how you express what you who you are and what you have to say, then um, everybody has something. Uh, to contribute through the arts, if they have the tools to make themselves um, understood. Um, I think, uh, for especially, there's no graceful way to say this, but for populations that are told by the larger society that they don't matter, that they can just be written off, that the country won't be worse for it if, if they just are shot by the police or if they just have no opportunity. Um, it's hard not to sort of take that lesson into yourself. Um, although the Black Power Movement did a good job helping people get it out of themselves. Um, being asked to, or given an opportunity to express yourself through the arts, what you really discover is that you do have something to say. Uh, you do have a difference you can make. Um, and 
I think there's there's sort of nothing important more important in, in the educational process than discovering that. Once you know that, then you've got a reason to learn all the other things they want to teach you because they become tools for how you're going to make your contribution to the world and make your presence felt and valued. Um, the challenge always is that um, our country has a very hard time, even though almost I've never met a person who was not involved with the arts in some way, even if it was salt and pepper shakers and uh, ashtrays and just objects. But I've never met anyone who was sort of free of the arts altogether. But as a country, we we have a hard time uh, knowing how to value something that you can't measure in dollars and cents uh, the same way. And so in our schools, um, you, you work for years to get an improvement in what's offered as arts in the schools. And then the first time there is a budget shortfall, uh, the arts get cut. Um, I worked for 10 years um, with this sort of blue ribbon committee that got the Los Angeles Unified School District to commit to a 10 year plan involving millions and millions of dollars. And in the 11th year, it started to be cut. Um, and I don't know if any of it survived uh, beyond that. A great thing has happened in California in this last year, uh, something called Proposition 28. Um, the former superintendent of schools, Austin Butner, who was a deep believer in, in the arts, um, he actually was chairman of the board of CalArts for a while, uh, used his political know-how to get the state to lock $1 billion a year uh, into its, its core budget for arts in the schools. Um, this is a tremendous opportunity. It, it, it was proved by uh, by proposition by the voters, so it has to be dis it has to be voted out to end it. They can't just decide to cut it. Um, so it's a real opportunity. The challenge now, and this will come around to your question about the role of artists in this. Um, uh, the challenge is we don't have the teachers in the schools capable of making good on those funds right now. We have had off and on in the past. Uh, but with all those cuts, they kept disappearing. Um, I think they're going to have to turn to artists in the schools to make good on the promise of this billion dollars a year. Um, and um, I think that's, that, that is a, a great opportunity and a reason for hope. Um, just a little, a little side note. Um, when I got to CalArts in 1988, it was deeply in deficit, doesn't matter why. Um, and the first program we started um, was one in which uh, stu uh, students from CalArts were going out into underserved neighborhoods of Los Angeles, uh, especially uh, the, um, the East Side and South Central, and teaching at community art centers. Um, and in the schools, um, the arts, and um, carrying our, our sort of approach, which is, uh, or the CalArts approach, which was starting from meaning and then developing the skills to express yourself, carrying that. And we just saw the miracles. Um, and they really feel like miracles, although they're not. They're just, when you, when you, when you step back from it, you realize it's just common sense. If people discover that they have something worth saying and that somebody else is willing to listen, uh, but that they have to figure out how to say it effectively, um, well, you're bound to find strength. Um, when we started that program, it was really not about producing artists. It was about producing people who realized they had every right to go to college and expect everything for themselves that, that kids with more financial background uh, expected for themselves. Um, and we saw it had exactly that that effect. Uh, I remember one mother saying to us that, uh, saying to us in tears uh, that she had dropped out of school at the age of uh, 16. She was terrified that her daughter would do the same thing. Um, 
that she could create the encouragement at home, but she couldn't make an environment that supported her daughter and her daughter's own desires to make opportunity for herself. And that just being part of these youth programs and the arts, she met other kids uh, who were aiming in the same positive direction, uh, positive's a dumb word, but um, uh, aiming to be who they could be. Uh, and that her daughter had said to her earlier that week, mom, I think I want to go to college. And she said she'd never thought she'd hear that from her daughter. Well, that's a sentimental story, and we can't base this all on sentimental stories, but it's all true. Um, so I don't know if that really answers your question, Zora, but that's that's at, that's at the heart of my idea of why it's essential. Um, and again, I think it's in some ways working artists are likely to be the best teachers of the arts because uh, they know what's in, at stake in making something where there was nothing. Um, and the normal teacher doesn't have that experience. Uh, if you teach chemistry, I mean, you have to be a creative teacher, but the chemistry is already there. Uh, if you teach art, there's potentially nothing there until you put it there. Uh, and that takes a, a, a brave and particular passionate way of being. Um, and I think artists are better able to convey that to other people than uh, people whose direct experience isn't that. Although, of course, there's always exceptions. I mean, there are wonderful teachers who find a way despite not being artists themselves. Um, I had a follow-up question. You just made me think of a lot. First off, I'm like part of this uh, service thing called Art Should, where we're like, we go to elementary schools and we like just do arts and crafts with them. So a lot of the things you said reminded me of it because like the way the kids get so happy and it's kind of just like, oh, like here are a lot of materials, like just be creative. And it like gives them that chance that they don't otherwise get in the classroom. You can really see like them learning more about themselves and what they like, which I think is like amazing. But um, going off of a few answers that you said, um, I was wondering like, what do you think makes for effective art education? Like, is it teaching students how to be good storytellers, teaching them to find their voice? And like, you talked a little bit about funds, like how do you think funds should be deployed? Like, is there a part of arts education that you see isn't getting adequate attention or adequate funding? I mean, probably overall is the case, but anything specifically? And also, mm -hmm. sorry, really quickly, Megan, I just add on like, is should art education be about teaching kids to be like good artists or like, is it more about like just being able to do art, if that makes sense? Um, well, uh, how do you, pr you pronounce your name, Megana? Megana? Megana. It's like Megan with an a, with an a. Just ignore that. Megan. And you're at University of Chicago, right? Yeah. And Chicago was one of the seedbeds of this notion of the world, uh, with a philosopher like Dewey. Uh, the University of Chicago itself, the Settlement House Movement. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it, it's one of the, the, the progenitors of the idea that you learn by doing uh, and you have to create the opportunities to do. Um, I, just, I just had to observe that. I'm, I'm glad to hear you're in that, that youth program. We got to the point where probably half of all our students we're teach, or that's probably exaggerating. Forty percent of all our students at Keller Arts were working at least one day a week at a community arts center somewhere in Los Angeles, um, and they all said it made them better artists. Not they all. Many of them said it made them better artists because they had to be able to articulate to the students what they themselves believed um, and why they were doing what they were doing. I do think it's important. Uh, it, it's not it's not just free creativity. Uh, I sort of believe in in setting problems, as it were, uh, or setting challenges um, to help help direct the students uh, towards something that will draw on what's in them. Um, I remember after one of the uh, moments of insurrection in Los Angeles, uh, I went to a, a youth uh, art show and also a professional artist art show. And the professional artist art show was full of 
good ideas, but most of the artists had not actually been directly affected by the burning down of their neighborhoods uh, and the murder of their neighbors. Um, and the student work was so much more powerful uh, because it was coming from someplace much deeper. Um, uh, it was coming from having lived through this and sort of having lived through it before there were riots and, and street. I mean, they were living with, in a violent atmosphere all the time. Um, and you could just see the, the, the sort of riches of that experience. But I think you, the, the role of the teacher in a way is, is to help the students discover what's already in them. Um, but but to, to to listen and to to see what's sometimes one's own personal experience is so awful uh, you don't know you don't know how to express it or you don't think you should express it. People are embarrassed by things that are done to them, whereas not <laughs> whereas the people who did it <laughs> who should be uh, you know ashamed. Um, and I think that the role of the teacher is to help the student through that. And then the next step is toward uh, discovering the extent to which you're actually communicating what you feel. And that, and that means being critical once the work exists about what, what were you trying to say? What do you think this, I'm talking about visual arts now, but it could be any of the arts. Uh, what what do you think what you just did what is saying? Um, and I think through that process, uh, you learn to be uh, self-critical without being self-denying. Um, and um, and gradually that moves toward greater and greater levels of professionalism. I'm thinking back to that first question about changes at CalArts. And I think one of the changes is when I was first there, students who were grappling with their ethnic and national identity, um, the teachers kept pressing them toward, how do you generalize this such that people outside your own community can understand what you're trying to say. I think, in, and I think that is an, ultimately that's the right way to go, but I think in the extremity in which we're now living, uh, the attack on sort of pretty much every community, um, uh, it is enough if you, it's enough if you can speak to your neighbors. Um, it's, and I, I expect the teachers have changed a little bit their sense that you have to aim for a larger, a larger audience um, outside your own immediate sort of interest group. Um, I, I would say, in, in one way, it makes sense. In another way, um, and I'm probably getting ahead of our conversation here. In another way, it's a pity because if we're ever going to make have generate the political will to genuinely change what's gone wrong in our system. Uh, we're going to have to take all these communities of interest and bring them together to realize that they're all victims of the same. Um, I mean, I don't want to get too abstract here, but the the same failing democracy in this in the same neoclassical, I mean, neoliberal economics, um, and that if we're going to push really push back against that, we're going to have to find ways to make common cause uh, that that let us do that. Um, one saw that in the early years of the civil rights movement, uh, especially of, of, in, the, in the work of, of Jews and African-Americans together, um, who recognized they had a shared experience of uh, oppression and uh, actually in murder. <laughs> um, and uh, you see these images of Martin Luther King and Abraham Heschel uh, leading a march together. Um, and, and in a way, I, I wish we could find a way to do that because as separate groups, we don't add up, we can make little modest changes, but we're not going to change the system. Uh, the system's going to take us finding a way to come together. Uh, and it's the system that has to be changed. 
sorry if that's got off the subject. That's sort of my hobby horse. Not at all, not at all. You said many, many beautiful things. And I think the one that stood out to me most is, I think the importance of finding your own voice and teaching children that they have a voice and that someone out there will listen to it. I feel like um, in primary education here in the US, a lot of the times we're just told to do and not create in, in terms of just like obeying and doing your homework and not really creating for yourself. So I think it's really important that if we're gonna have more art teachers in education that we first teach them that their voice matters. Um, I think I wanna stick on this topic and Zora had a really good question about imposter syndrome. So Zora, whenever you're ready, you can um, ask Mr. Levine. Yes, thank you. And thank you for such um, a thorough response um, to my question. I really resonated with a lot of things that you touched on. Um, but um, yes, in interviews, you have touched on how, unfortunately, all artists tend to fall victim to this phenomenon of imposter syndrome throughout their career slash artistic endeavors in general. And as an artist myself, I unfortunately can definitely speak to this, especially within the academic sphere. Um, and I personally want to know more of your opinions on this and what you believe that this may be a product of. Like, do you think it can be attributed to like elitism specifically within academia or perhaps something entirely different? And then before you answer, Mr. Levine, just wanted to remind our viewers, we are approaching uh, the Q&A portion shortly. So if you have any questions, feel free to add them um, as soon as they come up. Um, first, I would say, I think not just artists, <laughs> The vast majority of people who are self-conscious uh, suffer from the imposter syndrome. Um, we all, we all. I, I mean, I went to Harvard for graduate school, and I always felt like, what am I? If they knew who I was, <laughs> they would, they wouldn't let me be here. Um, there were always people who, you know, I've had friends who could memorize a five hundred line poem, and I couldn't do it. Uh, there's always people to make you feel like. Um, you're not really it. And then if what you've done is take on the challenge of trying to make something out of nothing uh, and, and go your own, I mean, deliberately go your own way, be in a field where the reward is not for doing it like someone else did it, but the reward is for finding your own way to do it. Well, how could you not feel like an imposter? Um, I, I, I think you'd be amazed at, at the number of career, I mean, nationally recognized career artists who still don't feel like they're really it um, and just have to steal themselves uh, to rise to the occasion. Um, and I, I think that's, that's what you have to do. Um, and it's a challenge because artists have to, and the, and the one way you have to try to be um, true to yourself whatever that is, and I think being true to yourself is almost impossible all by itself because ourselves are so complicated. Um, and then if you're supposed to pay attention to the effect it has on other people as well, well, that ought to be enough just to be true to yourself, but now you have to be, you have to be aware of what the rest of the world is thinking. Um, so it is, it is a mighty task. And um, as far as I can see, it's only the sociopaths who who escape um, some sense of uh, of the imposter syndrome? What does happen uh, is as you go on, you learn that at least this is my experience. I mean, when I became college president, I hadn't done anything to deserve to be a college president. I I just got the job, uh, and once you got the job, people think you ought to know how to do it, but you never did it before, so you don't know how to do it. Uh, you're just sort of making it up as you go along. Um, and then you do it enough times, and gradually you say, well, I guess I, if I'm an imposter, I'm a really good imposter. Uh, I am actually doing this. And I think in some ways it's that track record of actually having done it um, that helps you get beyond the imposter syndrome. Although even that's hard because a small number of artists get recognized and get outside reinforcement for the direction they're going. And many artists um, 
don't get it or don't get it until really late in their lives. I'm thinking right now about the number of African-American artists who have emerged in the last, well, they haven't emerged. They were there all along uh, making work, but but weren't getting attention uh, for, for reasons we could go into. Um, and now people in their 80s and 90s are finally getting um, the, the recognition they should have gotten 40 or 50 years before when it could have done them some good. Um, my, my wife, who's an artist, Janet Sternberg, uh, quoted me someone the other day who said, uh, I'm, you know, I'm 96. Uh, it's great that I'm getting all these offers to travel all over the world. But at 96, I don't really feel like traveling all over the world. I, I wish I had gotten these offers <laughs> Uh, when I could still do that. Um, anyway, that's that's sort of my answer. You you gain confidence by doing it and uh, just seeing your own the path you've made for yourself. But that's that's hard before the path exists. <laughs> no, that's very true. Thank you for that um, transparent, honest answer. Um, I think we have time for one more question, and I think we're going to pass it to Emma, who had a question about. The practical part of your career and about the books that you wrote about museums um so whenever you're ready emma yeah so like shifting from kind of the academic realm of art to the museum realm um during your career you've edited two um, influential books about museum practices um and the way that museum displays and spaces kind of influence visitors to museums um and a lot of my interest in museums comes from transforming like the museum with like its quiet halls you know and like formal attire to a place with community and curiosity um, and I'd love to know if you share that passion and also what you think are the most effective ways for transforming museums into a place more about community than ritual. Um, yeah the, these two books came out of um a program that I ran at the Rockefeller Foundation that gave money to uh, curators of color primarily, although not only, to do exhibitions that their museums would not do otherwise, um, either because they had such a strong community base of listening and participation that it was a more expensive way to do an exhibition, and the museum wasn't ready for listening to what its its audiences had to say um, um, it produced uh, exhibitions that uh, now are important historically but when we went back 10 years after the program was over every single one of the curators had been had been fired uh, because without the money coming from the outside their pushing to make real change uh, wasn't uh, recognized the, the two books came out of um, a, a sense that museums, when they try to present other people's cultures besides their own, often get it entirely wrong. Um, uh, just don't understand what they're looking at. Uh, I remember a very simple example of, of uh, a Native American exhibition uh, that had these rattles that are used in dancing. Um, and they were displayed upside down in a way you would never actually see them in practice because in practice they weren't, they were held in people's hands um, and manipulated. And it, it, it's sort of a, well, to the curators, it was just an object. And so you display it however you think the object would look nice. Um, those, those books became textbooks and have played a role, I think, in this current generation, which is making the most radical changes in museums, things that years ago we could we could never have imagined uh, that museums would be able to do this. Um, that, and I don't know if it'll last. You don't know how deep the convictions are, how much is is political, you know, passing bad. Uh, but you hope it is it is part of a much more fundamental change. 
uh, I think in this culture we're living in where the experiential has become so important, um, museums are learning that that they are part of, I mean, I hate to say this, but that they are part of an entertainment economy. Um, and they've got to offer the same depth of engagement um, or, or at least a competitive depth of engagement uh, that um, an entertainment ride in a theme park can offer. Uh, on the one hand, this tends to produce some really dumb shows um, uh, where everything is sacrificed to participation in some way. Um, but it, but it's, a, it's a move in probably the right direction. Uh, and I think for those of you who are interested in museum work, um, this is the, I mean, I've been around for a long time. Um, and this is the change we are all hoping for. Uh, I told the story about those curators being fired because they've all reemerged uh, as important figures. Uh, it's just that they were ahead of their time, the same way an artist can be ahead of their time. Um, and the world had to catch up with them. I'll just give you one last example. In front of the American Museum of Natural History, um, there was a statue of Theodore Roosevelt uh, on a horseback um, with one hand on the shoulder of a Native American and the other on the shoulder of uh, an African American, both walking on either side of the horse, um, a, a, a sort of deeply offensive figure. Um, Years ago, I was I I went I was asked to talk to the staff of the American Museum of Natural History about what to do about this, and I said basically you have two choices: uh, one, you can put a glass case around it and interpret what this statue represents, uh, or else you can remove it altogether. Well, they decided they wouldn't do either. They decided no one was paying any attention to it, and so they just leave it. Well, all these years later, finally, the world has caught up with them, and they've now removed the statue and moved it to a Teddy Roosevelt Museum in Nebraska or someplace. Um, I say this by both those stories about the curators and this, about the sort of generational nature of change uh, and how one has to keep pushing because the changes, even when they're obvious, they don't come easily. Um, Everybody is afraid of be, being rendered redundant themselves. And so there's inevitable resistance to change of who's going to be on the staff and how we're going to operate the institution. Um, uh, but right now, we are going through the, the most fundamental and rapid change, in, and not just at museums, in symphony orchestras, in cultural, in theaters, theaters with not just one dominating artistic director, but three or four different artistic directors representing different directions, uh, trying to find a way to get beyond um, sort of monocultural hierarchy uh, into something that is more nearly reflective of the complexity of the world we live in. Yeah. That's the end of that rant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Levine. Uh um, that's the end of our conversation, so now I'm going to pass it to uh, Emma to chair the Q&A, but thank you so much. I learned a lot in these past 40 minutes. I'm pretty, pretty sure our viewers have as well, um, and now uh, we'll see what they have uh, for you in terms of questions. Yes, yeah, so viewers, please put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, we have a question from Catherine Hess. Um, they ask, how does the desire to be more inclusive um, at CalArts square with the high cost of a CalArts education? And what more can be done to include more non-wealthy students? It is the absolute central challenge of higher education uh, at CalArts and at all but the 20 or so most richly endowed institutions. Um, unfortunately, the most richly endowed institutions who really could do this mostly are not so interested in doing it. It's those of us who don't have the money who want to do it. Uh, the answer is you have to raise scholarship funds. Uh, you have to try to hold down the cost, which is hard to do without compromising the quality. Uh, CalArts, we operated at a seven-to-one student-faculty ratio for undergraduates as well as graduates. 
because if you want to listen to every student individually, you've got to have enough faculty to be available to listen. Uh, you can't do it in classes of 40 or 50 people. Um, you do it in, in individual, you know, one-on-one -on -one or class with five or six people in it. Um, so, but still, you have to try to hold down the cost. Um, and then, uh, ultimately, it's about financial aid. Um, and uh, it, it is great to see the wealthy colleges having made, uh, I think Chicago is one of them, having made it basically tuition free if you don't have a family, if your family has less than, I don't know what, 120000 a year or some amount of money. Um, the shocking thing is when you look at a place like Harvard, which has also done that, I think it's 180000 there, um, how little it costs them because they don't have that many students uh, who don't have all that money. Um, but still, it's since everybody imitates those great name brand universities because they are great universities, it's still a good thing because it forces the rest of us to figure out how to live up to it within our means, but it has it has to be by by financial aid. We ought to be able to make our public institutions tuition free. Although, in fact, we're going through a national movement uh, led by the Republicans to defund our state universities altogether because they're seen as being too liberal. Um, uh, in fact, any institution that is trying to have diversity is seen as too liberal uh, by. Trump's version of the Republican Party. Um, but still, we, have, we just have to fight that fight, and there's there's no end to it. There, there's there's no end to it. Yeah, great answer. Scholarships, and it is interesting, the institutions that have the resources are not necessarily the ones that want to make the change, which is a frustrating facet of the world we live in. Yeah. <laughs> um, this next question, yeah, also kind of talks a little bit about um, the challenges that we face being people of a society. Um, but earlier on, you had mentioned that um, systemic change uh, in the arts and maybe in general is only possible when people come together to make it happen and don't stay within their own little bubble. Um, how do you envision we could overcome this polarization of society? I, um, I, I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, in a way, you, you can't blame. Um, in, a way the, in, a, in a way, the answer is education. Uh, you have to help people understand how, how deep and fundamental these problems are, how deeply embedded in the society and that it takes majorities voting um, to really make the changes. Um, but that's very hard if you if if right now if you are gay or transsexual and look at the legislation and I don't know how many states now that you can't talk about it, you can't, I mean, just trying to pretend it doesn't exist. Um, and often to drive those kids out of the schools altogether. Um, you can't blame people for fighting for the rights of the people who they are. But still, and I don't know how we do this besides through education, we have to get people to, to see um, the larger picture. My own sense, it's probably, it, somehow it ought to involve common cause between the old folks like me who have nothing to lose any longer. We've we've really had careers and had our opportunities. We don't have to be afraid. Um, and young people who are living it at the moment um, and have the, the courage and the idealism. If we could if we could get just those two groups together, um, you'd already be a long way toward uh, changing and it's interesting. Those are the two groups that vote for the Democratic Party by and large, although not solely. There are old folks who are Republicans as well. Um, but it's, I do think it's something we have to keep keep going back to again and again because the other is is sort of automatic. I mean, there's a rise. I'm Jewish, and there's a rise in anti-Semitism everywhere, 
And obviously I pay more attention to the articles about a synagogue being blown up. Well, I don't think I do pay more attention, but it hits me in a different way uh, than a church being attacked. Um, but it's the same thing, um, just under a different label. Um, and, and we've got to see that um, and, and push back against uh, the sort of easy recourse, not easy, um, but the automatic recourse to, to our group and who we are. Yeah, I think, I mean, education is huge and art education also. Um, this is a question that goes off of that. Um, do you think that there is a tendency to politicize the arts in a way that can be seen as problematic um, and kind of following, does art always have to be political? Is there such a thing as like non-political art? Um, in some ways, that is the key question. I wanna read you a quote from Thomas Mann. This is from 1945 um, in a letter to Hermann Hesse um, in which Hesse has accused Thomas Mann of becoming too political. Um, and uh, Mann writes, today, this is back in a letter to Hesse, today I believe nothing that is alive can sidestep politics. Even a refusal of politics is political. It merely abets the politics of evil. Um, on the one hand, I'm I'm tempted to say the situation in America is so bad right now that we need we need everybody who has a voice and a sense of decency uh, to be heard um, in in the cause of turning back from um, the wreck of our country. Um, but the reason I gave those other examples earlier is um, how to say this that those early feminist self-discovery activities in feminist art, um, it was political in one way, but it was, at that point it was entirely personal. Uh, it, was, it was politics enacted by who you are, who, who you are and how, what you become. Um, and so I, I wanna say there is a space for that. Um, uh, the, the Italian um, theoretician Buffo Berardi says that in this world where everything has been turned into economic value, uh, language, writing, is one of the few places that escapes easy turning it into dollars and cents. Um, and that it's going to be the, it's going to be, he says, it's going to be writers who help us escape uh, from turning everything into an economic decision. Um, and so part of me wants to say, in a way, we need artists as a way of uh, to, to fight, to keep a private space for ourselves, and to become ourselves in. Um, and that that is already political, although it's not overtly political. Uh, but it still is a space free or at least freer from uh, the dominating ideologies of the country. Um, but then I want to say that right now, uh, whatever else anyone does who has claims to decency, there's got to be some level of political activity. It may not be in their actual art. It may be in their work as activists outside their art making. But I sort of feel like all of us who who want to live in a decent world uh, really have to stand up right now and raise our voices uh, because the voices of the other voices are very loud and magnified by Twitter and the internet. Um, and these, these, our voices are not getting adequately heard. Clearly they heard some because President Biden did win the election. Uh, but if you list, if you go on the internet day in and day out, it's pretty hard to hear that voice coming through. And it's terrifying to think of the new election coming up. Um, so I guess I'm arguing that everybody needs to engage 
to the extent they are humanly able, obviously, some of us just, that's not our temperament. Um, I was never very good at sit-ins when I, I, I would go to them when I was in college, but I take my chemistry homework with me because I was afraid of getting behind. Um, and I got behind anyway. Um, that to the extent we can, we, we really need everybody who, and, and if you wanna be an artist, you, you, you have to want to in some way touch on the truth. Um, uh, and you have to want that truth to be heard. And, I, and so I, I think it needs to be expressed somewhere in one's life, even if it is not directly or overtly in one's art making. Yeah, and like, I think that all of us are, I believe that like everyone's an artist just by like how we move through the world as an act of art and also an act of politics. Um, we are also creative as we view art, right? And like take it in um, and experience it. Uh, for our last question, um, what are some of your favorite political artists? Um, in works in addition to maybe some of your favorite songs from the civil rights movement. This is from Leah Pressman. Oh, it's... there are just so many. Um, I, I, I am a, a great fan of, of Suzanne Lacey, uh, who was part of uh, that early generation of, of feminist artists who did not do things that were overtly political, but did things that were about the sort of community of women uh, gotten at it from various angles. Um, and mostly performance art. Uh, but if you weren't present and you look at the photographs, you could see what it was. Um, and it's, it's thrilling. Um, I think there, I'm not, I can't name names here, uh, but um, there's a lot to be learned from Latin American artists um, from the era of the of the colonels and the generals in uh, Chile and in Brazil and in Argentina, where the cost of your art was the possibility of being killed. And still artists found ways uh to to assert themselves in coded ways um i think we saw some of that recently in china where people just held up blank pieces of paper but everybody knew what those blank pieces of paper meant um and yet it was hard to put someone in jail for holding it well in china they figured out how to do it <laughs> put them in jail i'm a great fan of ai weiwei um right now um in part because he is so inventive about finding angles to get at uh, in terms of uh, political activity, uh, I mean, overt activism. Um, there's actually a book I would recommend to everybody uh, by a guy named Gregory Cholette, uh, who's a professor at Queens College uh, called The Art of Activism and the Activism of Art. Uh, and I would really urge it on you. It's uh, it it basically traces from about 1960 to the present, um, various acts of art and activism, and what they meant and how they how they function as as philosophy. Um, uh, it's it's available online and. It's just a short, which I love short. Uh, it's, it's a terrific book, and uh, it really helps clear your mind. I could name more, but... Um, no, that's beautiful. Um, enough for all of us to go and explore and continue to think about the very rich themes um, you brought up today. Stephen, thank you so much um, on behalf of the entire council. Um, this has been a wonderful opportunity. We are so lucky to have had the opportunity to speak with you today. Pleasure, um, pleasure I want, to with you. It's hard to find this uh, many I, people in one place. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to remind everyone about our next program, um, which will be on uh, June 28th. 
um, we are interviewing Colleen Smith. Um, so register, links will go out. Um, yes, support the WAND, support the arts. Um, Stephen, thank you so, so much. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you.